Hello, I'm really delighted to be here today to talk about my favorite topic, and that's HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer, because we've made such great progress over the last several years. These are my disclosures. And we've had really great success in finding the target of HER2 with our first approval of trastuzumab for metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer in 1998. And we've continued to make significant progress as shown here with all the approvals in the US um, by the FDA for different treatments. I'm gonna talk about these last um, four here uh, today and then some newer treatments that are coming down the line. If you look at the current landscape, it's shown here, and I'm not gonna talk about early breast cancer, but I'm gonna make the point that we're using pertuzumab and TDM1 quite a bit in early stage disease. And now in metastatic disease, the preferred first line treatment is a Cleopatra regimen with a tax saying trastuzumab, pertuzumab, second line TDM1. And then we have a lot of third line approaches, which is great news for patients because many of these patients who have very sensitive tumors to these HER2 targeted therapies live for many, many years. Now, if you look at the trials that have compared trastuzumab to a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, all of them really essentially show that the trastuzumab or monoclonal antibody is either has either better efficacy as shown in the MA31 trial compared to lapatinib or has better toxicity profile as shown in the Nefertiti study where there was basically the same efficacy, but the toxicity was much worse with the neratinib or the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So we've, we've seen this in many trials that these monoclonal antibodies are really superior. Now the Cleopatra regimen, I just presented this and published this last year, the end of study outcomes. And I think it's truly remarkable that there is a 37% survival at eight years with the use of this regimen first line. And just a caveat, only 10% of the patients had received adjuvant trastuzumab. And also the median progression-free survival was six months, but showing that 16.3% of patients, when we stopped this, and this is a lot of patients had been on, you know, eight, 10 years, the many of these patients, 16.3% had not even progressed. So showing that they had very sensitive disease. Now the questions that remain, can we eliminate chemotherapy in patients who have the ER positive, HER2 positive um, phenotype? That's a, a big question. And what about local therapy? We're seeing a lot more patients with de novo stage four disease now. What do we do for local therapy? And when do we stop HER2 targeted therapy? If you look at all the clinical trials with endocrine therapy, um, they're shown here. And, and the most relevant, I think, is the Pertain study, which compared pertuzumab, trastuzumab, and an AI to trastuzumab and an AI, showing a very good progression-free survival of 18.9 months. So this is an incredibly good outcome. The caveat to this trial is that they allowed chemotherapy. So about half of the patients on the trial did have chemotherapy and it was not randomized. So it's hard to really make an absolute conclusion from this, but certainly in, in certain patients, you might consider that. And if you look at the advanced breast cancer, fourth and fifth international consensus conference guideline statements for HER2 positive, what they basically say is first line treatment with endocrine therapy and HER2 targeted therapy should be reserved for patients who have one of these things, either have a contraindication to chemo, a strong preference against chemo, a very long disease-free interval with a minimal disease burden, for example, a soft tissue um, recurrence and very strong ERPR expression. So I think that's how we look at it now. And there are trials that are looking all over the world that are actually looking to use first line endocrine therapy um, and evaluating that to see if we could substitute it for chemotherapy. Now the issue of the surgical treatment or local treatment um, is an important one because these patients are doing so well. And as I said, about 50% are presenting with de novo disease, at least in the US. And this was from a NCDB where they looked at patients who had stage four HER2 positive breast cancer. And it's not randomized, but those patients who had 
all the things, surgery, radiation, and systemic therapy had the best survival. Uh, you know, again, the, you know, it's very biased because you could do these things, surgery and radiation, those patients who had um, better prognosis disease. Also, interestingly, when they looked at patients who got neoadjuvant HER2 in, in the HER2 positive setting versus adjuvant um, in this setting, those patients got neoadjuvant had also a better survival. So uh, I think, you know, it really shows what we're doing now in, in everyday practice. We've really pretty much switched to neoadjuvant treatment in the early um, disease to give neoadjuvant treatment first. Um, and then a lot of those patients actually don't recur. There is a, a study that is being proposed because I always get this question asked every time is when do you stop the HER2 targeted therapy? And this is a small, small study and it's really not randomized, but they wanna do a registry to see what the outcomes are after three years progression-free survival to see whether we can stop the, the HER2 targeted therapy because number one, the patients have to come in all the time and get the treatment. And number two, it, it is very costly to continue it. So does it really need to be continued is the question. Now, what about what's going on now or happened in 2020? What was the progress made? Well, I think one of the biggest excitements was looking at trastuzumab deruxtecan or TDXD, which is an antibody drug conjugate. As you can see here, it has a, um, linker that's cleavable, which is very important. And it has these um, eight, eight um, drug to antibody ratio, which is higher than TDM1. And TDM1, it was 3.5 to one. And the drug is different than TDM1. It's a topoisomerase one inhibitor. Um, it's membrane permeable. So you can have a bystander effect, meaning even after this, ADC binds to the HER2 receptor, you cleave off some of the drug and it can um, goes into the cell, can come out of the cell because it's the tumor cell because it's membrane permeable. And then you have other cells surrounding that are affected by the drug. It's pretty astounding results though. It's it's just a phase two study, but it was what was used for approval in the US was the response rate of about 61%. Progression-free survival in the recent update at San Antonio was 19.4 months with an overall survival of over two years. Now these are in patients who were pre-treated and about two thirds, I think had had pertuzumab, almost all TDM1. So they had much HER2 targeted therapy in the past. And the response is pretty quick. It's median of 1.6 months. And the negative about this, this drug is you do get interstitial lung disease. Now you can also see ILD with TDM1, trastuzumab and pertuzumab, but it's much, much lower. And here it was a 13.6% in this phase two study with some grade five, meaning deaths, four deaths from ILD. Now this was early on before it was really recognized. Now that we know about it, any patient needs to be questioned if there's any idea at all that they might have some lung disease, we stop the treatment right away and consider steroid therapy and then wait and see if it resolves. If it does resolve and the patient's doing well, you can restart if it's grade one. Certainly if it's grade two, you would stop the drug um, or grade three or four. But I think we're, we're getting better at recognizing this now and hopefully we won't have the um, grade five toxicities in the future. Now, the next study that is um, going to be done that's just opening now um, around the world, I think, the Destiny 09 study is comparing the TDXD to placebo, TDXD to pertuzumab, and then the, the Cleopatra regimen. And this is all in the first line setting. So trying to replace um, the Cleopatra regimen or the trastuzumab, pertuzumab with this very effective antibody drug conjugate therapy. Now, the other drug I wanted to mention was the margituximab, and this is the SOFIA trial, and it's an FC engineered, um, basically trastuzumab to activate the immune responses. So it increases the affinity to the activating var variants of CD16A receptor. And the results are not published yet, but have been presented several times showing a um, risk reduction of, of progression. It's only about 
three months median reduction. But when they did an exploratory survival analysis, they did show that those patients that had the carrier uh, or had the variant of the CD16A um, receptor seemed to have a better survival. Now that's very exploratory. So to me, this is a minimal um, benefit for patients, but it was approved by our FDA just recently um, in October. Next, the NALA study looks at duratinib, comparing it here to lapatinib, capecitabine, did show about a 2.2 month improvement in progression-free survival and also a decrease in the number of patients who presented with CNS metastasis. Again, this drug is very toxic, has almost 100% diarrhea. It can be controlled if you use a lot of antidiarrheals up front or you do a dose escalation type process, but it is very, uh, I think, difficult for the patients because of toxicity. Now, what about CNS metastasis? That's really our biggest unmet need. Now that we're doing so well with these patients that they do um, live for a long time, as I showed you, even with metastatic disease, but a lot of them then present with CNS meds, so probably 30 to 50 percent. So I'm going to just present a case. This is a 45-year-old premenopausal female who presented with a HER2 positive um, ER negative soft tissue liver and bone recurrence three years after the initial diagnosis. And this was one of my patients a few years ago. She had not had anti HER2 therapy because at the time it wasn't approved. So she got, I gave her the Cleopatra regimen with docetaxel for six cycles. She had a great response, very good PR, if not CR. But then three years later, she presented with CNS symptoms. Um, <clears throat> but her systemic disease was very stable by PET-CT. So this is her um, MRI of her brain. You can see she had a very large cerebellar met. Um, she had presented with vert vertigo, ataxia, and a headache. And then she had, you can't see them, but she had two to three very small mets in the cerebellum and parietal lobe. So what do we do next here? Um, do we do surgery? Do we do um, radiation? And what systemic therapy should we use? So those are the questions I'm going to try to answer with the data I'm showing you next. The Camilla study was a study that was prospective in 2000 patients and had a, a cohort of 126 patients, all treated with TDM1 um, prospectively. And amazingly, the clinical benefit rate was, was very high here. It was 43%. But the interesting part is the brain response rate was also 43%. And those patients who had not received radiation at all, the brain response was almost 50%. So I think it, it's um, a myth that these drugs don't get into the brain. I think the blood brain barrier is disrupted and they even these large molecules do get into the brain and you get responses. Also, when you looked at the ADC um, TDXD, there's a small amount of data showing um, that there's probably some efficacy there too, but there's trials ongoing looking at that molecule. Now, the HER2 CLIMB study was looking at tucatinib, which is a HER2 selective tyrosine kinase inhibitor, um, tucatinib trastuzumab capecitabine compared to placebo trastuzumab capecitabine. And these patients had all had trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and TDM1. It allowed brain mets. And there were a lot of patients, I think it was about 300 patients or so that actually had brain mets and some of them active brain mets, over a hundred at baseline. The results were pretty remarkable um, in that the progression-free survival was improved by about two months, 50% reduction in progression. And then even at the first presentation, the survival was improved. And this was about four and a half months improvement in survival. And again, as I said, a lot of these patients had brain mets, really, really active drug. If you look at just the group with brain mets that Nancy Lynn presented last year, you can see how remarkable the progression-free survival is with tucatinib in those patients who had um, brain mutts and even the overall survival. So really, really great data for this group of patients. So in, in our case, that we resected the cerebellar lesion, and unfortunately, because it was so large and in the cerebellum, she had a lot of um, post-surgical toxicity and infarcted part of the area and her performance status was not 
not good for a while, barely could walk or talk. Um, so she didn't have SBRT there and she did get SBRT three months later to the smaller lesions. And I changed her to TDM1 because of these multiple small parenchymal parietal brain lesions. And this was before tucatinib was approved because of the data showing that TDM1 could have e efficacy. And I correspond with this patient quite a bit and just a couple of weeks ago did and 18 months later, she's doing great. So it's a, a good story and why we should really try hard to treat these patients who have CNS disease for the best performance status possible. So if you just look at a summary of all these things, it's shown here what the different median progression-free survival and overall survival are. And, and you can see that we certainly have great um, progression-free survival. And this is old now because it's now increased to 19 months. And we have lots of lots of great therapy in this third line setting. When I looked just a couple of days ago, in the clinicaltrials.gov, I found that there were over 500 studies um, looking at HER2 positive advanced breast cancer. And that's exciting to me because it just shows this is a very responsive disease and we're just getting better and better with our treatments. And with that, we can also decrease toxicity. So there's lots of different things. There's other ADCs, there's HER3 monoclonal antibodies, PI3 kinase inhibitors, apelosib is being evaluated immunotherapy is being evaluated. Um, there's the subcutaneous pertuzumab, trastuzumab, which I think is great for maintenance therapy. Um, and so lots and lots of excitement in this area. Now just to remind you of older study, the Bolero studies, when they looked at, at these two trials together and, and they were Everolimus or placebo plus trastuzumab or venerelbine, those patients who had the PIK3CA mutation in their tumor had a benefit from Everlima. So don't forget about this drug. If you don't have the other ones available, this certainly will give activity in, especially if you've done next gen sequencing or an assay to figure out if the patient's tumor has a PIK3CA mutation. And then what I think is very exciting, I've thought for a long time, and finally now we're seeing the data that the CDK4-6 inhibitors are very active in the Monocur study. Um, looking at that, there was a benefit with the use of bemacyclib. And then most recently, Alice Pratt presented the biomarker data from the Mona Lisa ribocyclib studies, showing that 13% of the tumors in his analysis were HER2 enriched. We know those patients who have HER2 enriched have a better pass CR and better response to HER2 targeted therapy. Um, they, and this is without um, any kind of um, her two targeted therapy, but just ribocyclib alone, you can see that there was a benefit. So also don't forget about the CDK4 sixes in her two positive disease. This is a very exciting idea. And I know people have talked about this too, is looking at triple monoclonal antibodies. And this is a Chinese group that's looking at pertuzumab and a trastuzumab like molecule. Um, and then 19H6-U, which is a, also a monoclonal antibody that binds to domain three of the HER2 receptor. And in the preclinical data, the all three together had the best activity. So it's possible. We never thought pertuzumab and trastuzumab together would work. People poo-pooed it, didn't believe it. Look what we've seen with Cleopatra, it was great. So maybe one more is even gonna be better. So just to tantalize you so you can think about the future. Then the, um, the group, one group in the US, the TBCRC, is proposing a curative intent study. And this is with um, using everything, basically, THP, Cleopatra, then TDM1 to catnib, then TDXD, and then afterwards, HP into catnib. Now, I, I don't know how they're going to really know this, because this is only 77 patients. And many of the patients on Cleopatra, as I showed you, um, do well, 16%, for 8 to 10 years. I, I, I'm not sure I agree with this kind of approach, but it's certainly something to try. They're kind of throwing the kitchen sink um, at the tumors. I prefer looking at more specific treatments um, and, and not adding them all together. That's just a personal opinion. So to summarize, what we've got here is first line currently is the Cleopatra regimen. It could be 
placed by either trastuzumab durexican with that destiny study that we're seeing, or if a patient has brain mets, a lot of people are considering using the tucatinib regimen up front here if that's the, the condition. Second line, we're comparing TDXT to TDM1, too, so that may also replace it in second line. And then we've got all of our therapies here, third line, as we've discussed. So to conclude, the Cleopatra regimen resulted in a 37% eight-year survival. It's hard to beat that, but TDXD is going to try to do that. Newer HER2 targeted therapy with tucatinib and the TDXD are phenomenally active and really, as I mentioned, will most likely and already have been changing the order of treatment and, and hopefully survival. Lots of other targets are being evaluated, lots of exciting news there. And I really think we do have a chance to cure HER2 positive advanced breast cancer. And not everyone agrees with that, but I really think we will. So I wanted to end just by mentioning the Women Who Conquer Cancer International Mentorship Awards. And these are two of them. One, Dr. Vanderpie from Ghana, and Dr. Kabu from Turkey. And please, if you have any mentors that you think are really fabulous, send in your nominations next year. We just closed it for this year, but we really want to have more recognition of our international mentors and would love to have one from Egypt. So think about that when you're um, in the in next year when the fall comes. So thank you so much.